Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Mirat Malaku. Uh, I hope everyone watching this is doing well, staying safe, staying healthy. Uh, today is, as some of you may know, uh, the infamous Ivy Day, where uh, thousands upon thousands of kids, students, are getting their letters back from uh, Ivy League colleges. And this past couple of weeks has been, you know, um, a season where millions of students are getting admission letters back from colleges across the nation. In light of this uh, season, uh, I wanted to make a brief video about the admission process uh, from my perspective as a high school student. I was fortunate enough to uh, be accepted by Harvard University um, this uh, admission season under the Early Action Program uh, back in December. And so uh, what I wanted to do is just make a small video on the different things I think helped me be competitive for getting into Harvard and similar schools and uh, how hopefully for those of you who are watching this video, it can help you be competitive for those schools. I'll try and make it brief to the point and um, we'll just knock it out as we go along. Before I start, I just have two things to preface everything. Um, the first thing is that, you know, I'm sure some of you have already been on YouTube. There is hundreds of videos of uh, people that look just like me wearing the same jacket explaining, you know, similar things. Uh, as juicy as this subject is, I want to be frank and clear that there is no guaranteed way to getting into Harvard, to getting into Stanford, to getting into uh, these top schools. There are thousands of factors, there's thousands of variables that go into this process. And so uh, all this video is concerned with doing is showing you how to be competitive for these schools. So once you can reach that level of being competitive, of being contending for admission, then what happens after that really um, is in the minds of the admission officers. The second preface I want to lay down is with regards to students that come from uh, lower class backgrounds, um, specifically students of color who are overachievers, who are looking to apply to these schools. Uh, and the reason why I'm, I'm saying this is because I was looking at some of the stats uh, for the admission cycle uh, for the early action season of this year. And what was disconcerting to me was that although the total or general number of applications went through the roof for these Ivy League schools, the number of students of color uh, was not going up. In fact, in some cases, it was actually going down. And the general consensus as to why this was happening was because students were concerned about the cost of attending these Ivy League schools. And this is, of course, uh, a rational concern because these schools, of course, um, are charging upwards of 70000 80000 a year. But what I want to make clear is that when you're applying to the Ivy League schools, especially as a student from a lower class background, it's essentially go big or go home. And what I mean by that is that if you are accepted, these schools will move mountains to make sure that you can afford to go to college. They have billions of dollars of endowment. And so unlike other colleges, these top 10 schools have the ability to make sure that you can go to their school without having to take out a loan, without your parents having to pay thousands of dollars. In fact, in some cases, students can attend these schools without paying a penny. And so for those of you out there who are concerned about that, this is just to show you that there is no need to be afraid. You should apply to these schools if you think you can get in. And uh, the rest of it, as I told you, will play out as it goes. That said, let's just hop into the different tips and tricks that I thought um, helped me in my path to Harvard. Um, I want to first start by essentially dividing up uh, the admission process or the way colleges view you, the student, into four categories. Uh, grades, testing, passion, and community. And so we'll go into these four as we go. Oftentimes people tend to favor the first two over the last two. And if there's anything that I want for you guys to get out of this video is that if anything, the last two categories are just as important, if not more. So let's start by first talking about classes. Um, one of the things that has stuck with me in my experience with preparing for um, these elite top level schools is this idea of the 1% rule. In almost anything measurable, colleges like Harvard or Stanford or Princeton or Yale or MIT, 
are going to look for students that are in the top percentile of every category. So that applies to grades as well. These colleges are looking for students that are trying to take the hardest classes available to them and who get the highest scores in those classes. So obviously, as we all know, that entails being an A student, taking you know difficult college level classes, but it's also slightly more complicated than that because some of us go to schools where you have 20 APs offered. Some of us go to schools where there's seven APs are offered. And then there's some of us like me, for instance, who went to uh, a school where zero APs are offered. And so in that situation, you're probably thinking to yourself, how am I supposed to be competitive in this category of grades? And so the thing I want to get out um, for all of you watching is that these colleges are looking for the top percent within each context, within each context. So what that means is that they want to see you do the best you can in your given situation. So if you go to a school that offers, let's say six APs, and you know that you have a friend in another school who's taking eight APs, let's say, because his school has more APs offered, don't sweat it. Just take all the APs you can in your class, in your school, try and get A's in all of them. And because by virtue of the fact that you've taken every single difficult class that your school has offered, you're just as competitive, if not more, than your fellow at the other school who may not have taken as many uh, difficult classes relative to that that were offered. So it's, everything is based on context. For me to take uh, to put myself as an example, as I said, our school did not offer any AP classes, but they did offer what are called advanced honors classes. So they're basically around the same difficulty as an AP, but they don't have the AP credit or the reputation and, and whatnot. So what I did was to make myself competitive, I went out of my way to take every single advanced class that the school offered. And so by doing that, I realized I didn't have to take an AP because I'd already done the best I could in my situation, in my given context. The other thing I also wanna talk about is this idea of establishing a balance. And what I mean is that for those of you out there who do go to schools that offer 20 or 30 APs, that does not mean that you have to take 20 APs or you have to take um, you know, 25 APs because like I said, these colleges look at four categories. So if you put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, if you spend all your time trying to get every single AP down, you're getting every single A, then you're not gonna have enough time to be able to work on standardized testing, to be able to work on extracurriculars, to be able to work on community service. And so in the end, you're not gonna be competitive. So finding a balance is key. From what I've seen from the people I've talked to, the golden number of APs to take is usually between eight to 12. So if you can get between eight to 12 classes under your belt, then you're good. Don't take any more than that. Um, the other thing also is that a lot of students are very uh, discouraged about applying to Ivy Leagues because they, let's say they have one B on their transcript. And so I wanna make it clear that Although a B is not something you would like to have on your resume if you're applying to Ivy League, and a lot of most you know, admits don't have Bs on their resume, it is possible for you to still be competitive. The way that you're able to make up for that B is by adding more pizzazz to the other category. So it's all about having a balance. Uh, the other thing I'd also add is for those of you who are maybe scared or don't want to get a B in classes, that there are tips and tricks to make sure that you can be um, the best student you can, the most competitive student you can, even within the academic category. And what I mean by that is first, I'm sure every student has a weak spot in classes. For instance, for me, my weak spot was physics. Maybe some of you can empathize with that. And so when I took my the advanced honors physics class in my school, what I did was because I knew that this was a difficult subject for me, I made sure to set time, especially for that class out of all of the subjects um, in my school schedule. And I also made sure to go to all the office hours that were set by the teacher, whether that was during lunch, whether that was after school, and making sure to ask as many questions as possible and writing down as many notes as possible. And the final thing I would also add about being able to get an A in a difficult subject is this idea that you should work smart and hard. A lot of people talk about working hard, which is important. Discipline is incredibly important. 
But if working hard means you're just staring at a textbook for six hours, then that's not going to get you the A you want. So you're going to have to learn how to be smart, how to work smart, how to work efficiently. The other thing I'll add um, before I move to the second category is the idea of GPA. A lot of us are very fixated with GPA. And I can tell you personally, when I was binging on those you know, uh, YouTube videos of, of students that got into Harvard and they're talking about 4.8, 4.9, 5.0 GPA, I'm a little worried because I'm like, these numbers are a little bit out of my field. In fact, they're impossible for me to reach because our school doesn't offer enough weighted classes to even reach a 4.8 or a 4.9. And so uh, the same message that I put about grades applies here, meaning the goal to be competitive is to have the best GPA you can relative to your context. So to put myself as an example, I have, I think it's 4.4 GPA, which is pretty much average for most Harvard admins, right? It's not top of the line. It's not the highest ultra competitive you can get. But what made me competitive, I believe, in terms of my GPA was the fact that it was the highest in the class. And this was listed on a school report. So given in my context, even though maybe there's someone else applying that has a 4.6, that 4.4 would actually have more impact and more value than the 4.6 of another person if that 4.6 wasn't the highest. So again, it's about percentile. If you can land in the top percent, then you're good. The second category, like I said, is testing. Um, testing is something similar to grades that a lot of parents and students worry about, they stress themselves out. And oftentimes they worry too much about this. Uh, and one of the things I wanna talk about in this video is the idea that colleges are increasingly um, putting less emphasis on standardized testing. And the reason why I say this is because first off, as you all know, not only was this admission um, season uh, made test optional, but the next uh, admission season. So for those of you juniors who are seniors, testing has become optional. And in addition to that, the College Board has canceled permanently subject tests. So this just shows you how colleges, although I will say, I still do look for SATs. Don't say, oh, it's optional, I don't have to take SAT, ACT. You better take the SAT, you better take the ACT. But remember that colleges are now looking less at testing and a little more at extracurriculars, a little more at passion. And I'll get to that in full depth. But yeah, let's talk about testing. Again, the top 1% rule applies to testing. And what that means is that to be competitive, you're going to have to score in the top percentile of either the SAT or the ACT. For the SAT, this means that you should probably be able to score um, above a 1510 out of 1600 on the SAT. For the ACT, that means you should be able to score a 34 and up out of 36. If you can do that, then you're competitive. So that's what we mean by top 1%. A lot of students try to uh, take both the SAT and the ACT. And in my opinion, I think that's just unnecessary because colleges look at the SAT and ACT in terms of whether it's a signifier of your readiness for college. So it's not just because you're taking the SAT or because you're taking the ACT. It has a functional value. So if you want to take a standardized test, and I, I highly recommend you do, then choose one. Either take the SAT or take the ACT. I took the SAT and that was the only test I took. The other thing I also wanna add is that you should learn which test is right for you. So what I highly recommend for those of you who are in 10th grade or in 11th grade is that you should take a practice SAT and a practice ACT. Take both tests and look at the score you got on both tests. Look at how you felt when you took those tests and determine which test you think you have a higher potential of scoring on. So for me, I'll say I took the SAT, I took the ACT. I got similar scores in both, but I felt much better taking the SAT than taking the ACT. So I opted to take the SAT. And you can find a lot of articles that um, talk about the different attributes in students that these tests cater to. So for instance, the SAT gives you more time on the test, but it has harder questions in general. It has more critical thinking questions. Whereas the ACT tends to have less time given to you and more questions. And, and then there's also, you know, questions about whether you're a STEM person or whether you are 
a more humanities person. So looking into this, researching about the tests is key. And the final thing I'll talk about um, is that preparing for these tests is also important. Preparing for these tests. Some of us don't do our due diligence. And I think the key to being able to get a high score on the SAT is accustoming yourself to the test because the test has in itself a code, a formula. You can learn how to essentially hack the SAT. And because all the questions are structured in the same way, the test writers have rules and codes and formulas by which they manufacture these questions. So to accustom yourself, take as many practice tests as you can. Take as many as you can, and, and when, you, when they come back to you, when you grade them, look at the type of questions you got wrong. Because always there's a pattern. Like for instance, for me, I had a pattern of getting math word problems wrong. I just wasn't good at translating the English into the math. So what I did was I sat down and I hammered into myself how to learn to decipher the words in a math word problem and you know uh, translate it into the math, right, into the numbers. And so you, you might have a weakness maybe in reading comprehension, maybe in geometry, Whatever the case is, find that weakness, find the chink in your armor, and learn how to be able to overcome it. A big tip is use Khan Academy. Khan Academy has a lot of SAT problems, and they even give you the corrections. They show you um, how you can be able to get better at solving these problems. So that's also very helpful. And I think that was very helpful for me as well. When you get a score on the SAT or ACT that's in the top percentile, don't try and take it again. Like to put myself as an example, I got a 1530 on the SAT and I know students that got 1540s, 1550s, 1560s, but I did not opt to take the SAT a second time because I'd already reached the top percentile. I was already competitive. So rather than spend my time studying, trying to get maybe 20, 30, 40 extra points, I decided to spend my time working on the other categories, balancing myself out. So for those of you that got above a 1510 or Maybe a 1520, I would say. The average um, SAT score for Harvard admits is 1520. If you get above that, then you can stop. That's enough. You've, you've triumphed over the second category. All right. Uh, the third category is passion. And I call it passion. Another word is extracurriculars. I like the term passion more because that was always the way uh, my parents told me. You know, that was the, the mindset that they had, the idea of picking something that you have a passion for, that you have a curiosity for. And I find that it makes the category a lot easier. Um, it's a lot easier to do something that you like, um, something that you're good at, something that you're curious about than doing something that you're not. Uh, extracurriculars, in my opinion, are one of the most misunderstood categories amongst both parents and students. And so I wanna kind of air, clear the air and show the different ways we can triumph over this category one and two um, to show you how important this category is because this is in my opinion um, one of the most important categories i'll say for myself personally although i was competitive academically speaking what i believe got me into harvard was my extracurriculars and my community service and the two are quite closely linked so just to show you the importance the first thing i want to note in terms of misconceptions, is that it's not about how many extracurriculars you take. I'll say that again. It's not about how many extracurriculars you take. Some people take like 20 different extracurriculars and that is not going to make you competitive. In fact, that might make you less competitive because you've spread yourself so thin on so many different activities that you haven't probably able to log in something that's meaningful, that's impactful, that's eye-opening and jaw-dropping. So, my um, tip is that you should hone in and focus on maybe three or four different extracurriculars that you think can wow the admission counselors. Um, and it's important because these admission counselors are smart. They can see through you know, the bogus and nonsense. So adding a bunch of different stuff that you attended maybe like once a month, that doesn't count. Don't do that. You want to actually show commitment and impact in your extracurriculars. Quality over quantity. Second is don't be generic in your extracurriculars. For instance, I see a lot of students that like to do track, that like to do basketball. And I'll tell you, I'm a basketball fan, go Lakers. I love basketball, I love sports. But 
when you're applying to these top elite colleges, unless you're six eight, you can dunk. Um, you're a nationally recruited athlete. You're not going to be competitive in that. That's just to be frank. So you can play basketball after school. You can go to the Y and hoop with your buddies, but that's not going to be something that you want to put on your resume as a Harvard applicant. Instead, what I would recommend is that you want to find something that's unique. You want to find an extracurricular that you think that no one else really does. Something that really you, as a unique person in your own background, can make your own. So to put myself as an example, I, as some of you may know, I'm a, a classically trained pianist. That means I, I play classical music. And um, for someone that's a, a pianist of color, that's pretty much an anomaly. There's not a lot of people that do that. And I had an opportunity, first off, to be competitive in that field, not just as someone of a unique background, but also as someone that can, that can fuse my own unique identity. So for example, in my music portfolio that I submitted to these colleges, I made sure to include a performance of an Ethiopian classical music piece. That's pretty unique. You're not gonna find a lot of people that are gonna be performing a, you know, a cultural fusion of East and West of different genres. So that's just to show you an example of how you can be unique in your extracurriculars. Um, and so again, this goes back to the work smart and also work hard. Some people will spend hundreds of man hours on the field playing um, different sports or spend hours doing you know, different extracurriculars and it just doesn't end up in their favor. So work smart and work hard, combine the two. Uh, third, be a leader in your extracurriculars. Uh, a lot of times people gravitate to activities that their friends are doing. So they'll join a popular club, they'll join a popular musical. And my tip for those of you who are trying to be competitive for these schools is whatever people are doing, don't do it. Don't be a sheep. You want to be a leader. So you want to find an activity where you are the one doing the decision making, where you're the leader, where you're the one who can claim responsibility, claim leadership. So for instance, in my school, we have a lot of clubs. We're a school that's known for you know, doing a lot of outside of class activities. So rather than joining or just joining a club where I'm just a member and I'm just not really doing anything impactful, I decided to start my own club. So you can see here how I'm trying to become a leader. I'm trying to claim something that's mine so that colleges can see that I'm someone that's trying to work independently. And you know what I'm saying? So that's an important thing to kind of um, keep in the back of your mind. That doesn't mean you have to start your own thing. I, there's plenty of Harvard admins that have joined, you know, reputable organizations and they climb up the, the ladder, they climb up the ranks and they become leaders in that field. So the point is, whatever you're doing, you want to be a leader. You want to become the one that's doing the decisions, that's doing the work. So that's, that's important. Honing and perfecting extracurriculars is something that you do starting at the beginning of high school. I'll do that again. I'll say that again. Um, honing and perfecting extracurriculars is something that you have to do at the beginning of high school. One of the things that I remember um, stuck with me in ninth grade when me and my parents walk in for a meeting with the high school director is this idea that the first day of ninth grade is the beginning of your path to college. It starts there. And I would even argue it might even start before that because I'll say for myself as a pianist, my, extra, my musical extracurricular was something that I had been developing since the age of five. So at the time I had been in high school, I had won a scholarship to a, a music school. I was taking a personal repertoire class. I was part of the Chamber Music Institute. I was taking college level music theory classes, all of this at the beginning of ninth grade. So this shows college's consistency. It shows commitment. It shows discipline. And it also shows skill. Because if you want to take up, let's say, piano at the beginning of ninth grade, then you're not going to have a lot to show for in 12th grade. But let's say you're already able to play a sonata at ninth grade, then your odds are in your favor. So that's also important. Extracurriculars can also be extensions of the academic subjects people, students pursue. So that means I highly urge apply to academic competitions, apply to internships, apply to research pro um, programs. There's a lot of you maybe that are very academically minded, you're STEM students, and that's very good. So you should apply. I myself applied to internships, I've applied to research programs, and I found that that helped me a lot in my resume as well. So I highly recommend that as well. The final category is community. 
And this is something that top schools have emphasized they want recently. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because I want to make it clear that colleges are not concerned with a student that spends their day at home poring over textbooks. That's not the kind of person they want. They want a person that they can invest in, right? Their letter of admission is an act of investment. They're investing in you. They're investing because they believe you have the potential to be a leader in the community, to impact your community, to change their community. So community service is very, very, very important. And like I said, I think that was one of the things that I think led to my admission. Uh, and I'll just put, I'll put myself as an example. So first, some of you may know, uh, I serve in my religious community as, as a preacher, as a teacher, I work with kids. Uh, I actually wrote a book on my faith that I spread to uh, different people across different states, across different countries, even across different continents. So that's community service. For those of you who are maybe involved in religious organizations or cultural organizations, do not forget to put that on your resume. That counts. That's community service. You're impacting your community. So that's a very, very big um, component of extracurricular, I mean, uh, of community. Also, to use myself as an example, I, like I told you, I founded a club at my school. This club, the Civil Discourse Club, was concerned with combating political uh, polarization. And so I got awards from this. Um, a lot of schools heard about this. And so I spread a lot of awareness for political polarization through this club. So that's also community service. Um, something else also I did was that I uh, worked with my school's administration to start a class, a course that people could take about civil discourse, about dialogue. I attended a leadership um, conflict resolution uh, organization where I was professionally trained in facilitation. So these are different ways I'm just throwing at you as to how you can be able to do well in the category of community. If you don't know where to start off, I recommend looking at the different opportunities that your school offers, looking into charities and organizations you're passionate about. Um, and again, remember to not be a sheep. Claim responsibility, be a leader. So these are the four categories, um, and they'll be crystallized essentially in how you fill out your essays. So this goes out especially to my juniors, those of you going into senior year. You've done at this point all you could in terms of the four categories. Maybe you have a little bit left. The main thing now as you enter senior year is crafting your college essay, crafting your personal statement. And this is very important because Admission counselors need to look at the essays to determine what are the things you value, what are your activities, etc. The one tip I give about essays, first off, start early. Start early. Don't pressure yourself. Start the summer before senior year. A lot of people, I'll say in my grade, were stressing, they were anxious because they put it off to the final hour. I started in July, so I was kicking back and relaxing, you know, by mid semester because I'd already gotten everything out of the way. Um, and this was especially useful for me in a lot of ways. Also, construct a narrative. You're going to have a lot of essays thrown at you, and you want to be able to you want to be able to look at yourself, reflect on who you are, and look at the theme of your life, the theme of your high school career, and use that theme to construct a narrative throughout your essays. For instance, my theme, my narrative was about helping people to understand each other. So, for instance, I talked about as a pianist, I help audiences. Um, understand the music of composers. As a teacher, I help people understand their faith. As uh, a civil discourse facilit facilitator, excuse me, I help people understand each other's political perspective. Then I tied that to my um, to my desire to become a physician, as a, to be a doctor, because I want to enter the medicine field in college, and how I want for patients to have a culturally uh, culturally sensitive uh, care for them. So this is an example of a narrative I built, and of course you want to add of course, the different rhetoric, you want to have a well-written essay, you want your college counselor, your advisor, your parents, your teachers to look it over, and that's the key to being able to build a good essay. And then the final thing, I know it's a little bit not so brief, is interviews. So a lot of people are scared about interviews. This goes out to the seniors, interviews. And especially with the Ivy League, there's a lot of articles I've read about the Harvard interview process, the Harvard, uh, Princeton, Yale, the different ways that they, they are taking notes on students when they're interviewing them. My advice is that the last thing you want to do is stress. Don't stress at all. Because when you stress, when you enter the interview, 
the counselor is going to look at you and he's going to think you're self, you're self conscious. He's going to think that you're not confident in yourself. So be um, authentic. Be charismatic. Be confident in yourself. And all of that is going to just flow from you. Because if you're confident in who you are, then you'll have the natural attributes of, of charisma, of leadership, of confidence. That's the first thing. The second thing is prepare for your interview. Being authentic doesn't mean you wing it, right? I spent the weekend before my interview looking over possible questions, looking at different tips, right? Different questions like, why are you applying to Harvard? What do you want to study in Harvard? Uh, what are the different professors that you're interested in meeting? Different courses you're interested in taking? Etc. Etc. And I think that paid off for me because I was able to mention how I'm interested as someone that loves uh, human biology. I'm interested in the CRISPR project that Harvard was involved in. So then my interviewer asked me in depth different questions about CRISPR. Now, if I hadn't prepared, then I would have been, you know, painted into a corner. I wouldn't know how to respond. But because I prepared, I was able to, to share my knowledge on the subject my knowledge on the different Harvard professors that are involved with this project. And so I ended up actually gaining a point rather than losing a point. So prepare for your interviews. Go big and go home again. So these are my tips for how to be competitive for Harvard. My final thing is just be disciplined. Take advantage of every opportunity. For those of you who are looking at colleges right now, please do not pick one college you want to go to. I made that mistake. I wanted to go to Harvard since maybe middle school. And the month before the letters were sent out was the most torturous month of my life because every hour, every second, I was thinking, what if I get in? What if I don't get in? So rather than having that much stress and anxiety and rather than possibly ruining the rest of your senior year if you don't get in, just say to yourself, I want to get into a top school. And so whether that's Harvard or Stanford or Columbia or Yale or Stanford or Brown or I live in LA, so UCLA or UC Berkeley, Whatever that school is, the universe will take you there. Destiny will play out as it, as it is, and you'll go on your way. So that's my tip. Um, so I hope those, those of you who have watched have gleaned at least one or two things from this video. Um, thank you guys very much. Stay safe.